Hello once again and welcome back to the fastest half hour on the crypto world. This week is Bigfoot, the news show that scours the internet and the Bigfoot community each and every week to bring you the people, places, and stories making headlines around the Bigfoot world. Then we take it and wrap it up in a nice, neat 30 minute package. If it has to do with Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and Wild Man, trust me, we've got you covered. Now we've been busy while we've been away, putting together an even faster paced look at the world of Bigfoot. Tonight, we kick off the fall season with Big Bob Hieronymus. Was he really the man in the suit that fateful autumn day? Some say yes, some say no. We'll take a look at the facts. Mike Luigi's got an exclusive on the Man Beast of Western New York film. Snow Walker Prime talks with Bigfoot in the season's first two minutes with, and the Bigfoot Rundown makes its debut. You won't want to miss that. These stories are the most Bigfoot news you can get without your parents' permission, so you better buckle up, settle in, and smash that subscribe button, because it's time to get at it. Ready? Let's go. Is walking upright like a man. Well, we just don't want something crawling around out here. Put the wind back up to melt. Get somebody out there. Go put on the out there. That's a bitch is about six foot nine. I don't know. He's all black and big. With all the commotion surrounding last week's alleged Colorado Bigfoot sighting, more on that later, it got me thinking about the first guy claiming to be Bigfoot way back in 1967, before most of us were even born. I know I wasn't. And over the years, Bob Hieronymus' bold claims about the famous Patterson-Gimlin film have become a subject of debate and skepticism within the Bigfoot community. While Hieronymus' allegations claim the entire film was a fabricated hoax, there are several inconsistencies and unanswered questions that casts some serious doubt about his credibility. We kick off the fall season of This Week in Bigfoot, taking a look into some of these key points, challenging Bob Hieronymus' side of the story, to see if we can shed some light on that day and separate fact from fiction. Hieronymus' initial description of the suit he had claimed to have worn that day, what she said, by the way, was made by Roger Patterson himself, differs significantly from the suit that he later said was supplied by costume maker Philip Morris. He described Patterson's suit as having a zipperless upper torso, while Morris's suit had a back zipper. Morris noted that his suit, which he claimed to have positively identified from the film, was modified. Morris claims that the face mask was replaced, most likely by one of leather, such as horsehide, and stuffed breasts were added, you know, Patty, most likely from the extra fur Patterson had requested to be included with the suit. That's what Morris claims. Well, I ran around with uh, Roger for a while, and he figured a... Uh that he would make a suit or have a suit made, have somebody wear it, they would take a film of it and prove to the world that, you know, there was re a real Bigfoot. Well, uh, I was a big, stout guy, you know, back then, and that's who they needed. They needed somebody they could trust, and uh, they asked me if I would do it for $1,000. Moore stated that the modifications were necessary to convert the gorilla costume into a more credible-looking Bigfoot suit. Hieronymus eventually changed his side of the story, stating that Morris did indeed provide the suit, but Roger Patterson made the modifications. The differences between the two suits are way too an important feature to be a simple mistake or oversight. And creating a suit to match the details observed in the film, remember now this is 1967, would require extensive modifications. Casting doubt on the claim that Hieronymus or Patterson bought a gorilla costume from anyone. After the filming, Hieronymus stated that he had the suit for only two days before Roger Patterson came to collect it. However, there are testimonies, collected by Knight during his investigation, indicating that Hieronymus showed the suit to family and friends several times over the years, sometimes from the trunk of his mother's Buick, starting in early 1968. This clearly suggests that Hieronymus may have had another suit, which his reluctance to admit raises more questions about his honesty. In Greg Long's book, The Making of Bigfoot, The Inside Story, Bob Hieronymus claimed to have walked across Bluff Creek during that day, stating that it was dry at the time. However, the late John Green, legendary Bigfoot researcher, requested and received reports from the U.S. government, clearly indicating that Bluff Creek does not run dry. This inconsistency yet again questions the accuracy of the account that day that Bob Hieronymus states he had. Another blaring inconsistency is the fact that for some strange reason, Bob never attempted to ask for payment from Roger Patterson or anyone else for his part in the hoax. Even when the film was making a lot of money, Hieronymus never asked to be reimbursed. And even after Roger Patterson's death in 1972, Bob said he kept his mouth shut and remained hopeful that one day someone would pay him back. 
I mean, to be honest, if I had been the guy in the suit, let me tell you, I would have gotten paid to keep my mouth shut. Just saying. Patty's size, frame, and stature are embedded in the minds of everyone that has ever been interested in Bigfoot and have seen the film. Bob Hieronymus' physical proportions simply do not match those of Patty's. His torso, thighs, and shoulders are much slimmer. All of this once again suggests that Bob Hieronymus most likely wasn't the Bigfoot captured on that footage. Hieronymus' ever-evolving and sometimes conflicting statements about the suit and the events surrounding the filming, as you can see, raise serious concerns regarding his credibility. While Bob Hieronymus' claims regarding the Patterson-Gimlin film raise serious questions about the authenticity of the footage, there are way too many inconsistencies, discrepancies, and unexplained details challenging his credibility. Now, these points mentioned here, and these are just a few of many, were all investigated and described in much more detail by Roger Knight. These clearly suggest that Bob Hieronymus' account may not be as straightforward as he portrays it, and some serious skepticism is warranted when evaluating his claims. As it, uh, as it walked across his hand before, I was able to get uh, uh, some fairly good footage of it. It turned uh, a couple of times and looked at us, and as it, uh, as it turned, uh, uh, it seemed to give me the impression that it didn't want uh, anything to do with it. Now, the validity of the PG film remains a subject of debate, and it always will. And the case for it being a genuine recording of a Bigfoot sighting is not easily dismissed. But if it was indeed some man in a suit that day, it probably wasn't Bob Hieronymus. Having attended college in Buffalo, Western New York has a very special place in my heart. The region has a history entrenched in stories of hauntings, UFOs, and other high strangeness phenomena. And I always thought this lesser known part of New York State is among the most underrated areas for Bigfoot research. And a recently released documentary might help prove that point. Released on October 1st, The Man Beast of Western New York has garnered over 100,000 views as of recording the segment. Published on the Whispering Hollow YouTube channel, this documentary delves into Western New York's extensive history of Bigfoot sightings. I got a chance to catch up with director Jordan Warner on his inspiration for creating this documentary, and uh, here's what he had to say. Because at the time, I was going to do a project in Ohio, but try to do something different. And then he, there is a chapter where he talked about um, a woman here in Western New York who had ongoing activity on her property. And I'm like, holy crap. I'm like, this is stuff that you don't hear about. So I, I was just kind of eating away of what he was describing in this book. And then I just kind of look her up and said, hey, my name is Jordan. I'm working on a documentary. Can I interview you? And then I think it was on Halloween. Um, Two years ago, maybe we we met her at her farm, and she basically just told told us like this is where this happened, this is where that happened, and I was just like, wow, this this is amazing. And then of course, when you talk to one person, there's another person, and another person, and another person. Then you find you go down the rabbit hole and start finding all these various people. So it was really cool to like, okay, I don't have to like travel long ways to the Adirondacks or, you know, the Catskills, I can just <laughs> go here and... Unlike most Bigfoot documentaries, The Man Beast of Western New York is uniquely told through more than a dozen interviews. There's no imposing biases or narratives being pushed, just an honest, straightforward perspective of Bigfoot's reported presence in Western New York that's solely chronicled by the opinions and firsthand accounts from witnesses, skeptics, members of local Native American tribes, along with prominent New York-based researchers like Ryan Reading and Paul Bartholomew. When I spoke with Jordan, he shared some of his thoughts on why he framed the documentary with this unique approach. Just kind of, not in a sense state the facts, but really just kind of, hey, this is their story, this is what they believe in, I'm going to tell you what they think, what they perceive, what they believe, and you take it what it is. It's simple and just more of their side rather than having the over you know overly narrative entertainment hollywood you know coming up next just this is it the film features some compelling recountings of alleged encounters it takes a deep dive into western new york's native american lore and its potential ties to bigfoot it even checks out some potential evidence one witness collected along with some thought-provoking observations from members of the scientific community that bring Bigfoot's evolutionary capabilities into question. Something that 
would resemble somewhere between an ape and a human at this point. And I think the important thing to outline when talking about evolution, and that's one of my favorite topics because I find it interesting, it's, it's something that we're still trying to understand, is that even humans have many failed branches. Just recently they think that they've discovered yet another failed branch. We succeeded, but we're not the only try at this. Also, you have a difference between new world and old world. So this is a phenomenon all over the planet. But if you're looking at apes in particular, or monkeys, you have new world monkeys and old world monkeys. And there's a big difference between the other continent and this continent. Alligators have looked like alligators, or crocodilians to put a broader sense, since they were dinosaurs. Since there were before dinosaurs, there was an animal that looked just like that. Why? Hasn't it changed then? Why didn't it evolve? And all this time, we came along in, in incredible adaptations. Why? Because it's perfectly successful. It doesn't need to. It doesn't need to. And sometimes people say, what do you think humans will look like in a couple hundred years or a couple thousand years? Exactly like this. We don't need to evolve anymore. Medicine has replaced that need for natural selection. The Man Beast of Western New York is one of the first documentaries that takes a true deep dive into Bigfoot's history in this part of North America. If there's anything to take away from this film, it's that we should see things in a broader perspective and embrace the mysteries this world has to offer. On that note, I'll leave you with these thoughts Jordan had to say on that exact matter. Now, some, some skeptics would say, well, it's just the human mind. You know, you want to believe in something fantastic and, you know, mythical because it's it's a need well yeah, yeah it is a need when the mind is overwhelmed by beauty it allows the supernatural to enter in when you're admired by enchantment you know when when you're you're present with nature you're present with life you're not so focused on the past the future stress anxiety heart attacks you know you're you're, you're present in the moment to see what's already there and I think whatever that entails, you're able to see clearly. And that's kind of what I want to do with these projects is, yeah, this is their story. This is what people experience. Take it. For decades, the legend of Bigfoot has captivated the imagination of people around the world. Sightings and accounts of the mysterious being abound, yet one most perplexing question remains unanswered. What does Bigfoot eat and how does it survive in the wild? The diet of Bigfoot has long been a matter of speculation and debate. Various theories have emerged over the years, each offering a different perspective on what sustains the massive creature. According to numerous eyewitness accounts, Bigfoot's diet may include anything from white-tailed deer to elk, blue, straw, and raspberries. Some reports suggest that Bigfoot is a herbivore, feeding on a diet of berries, roots, and leaves, and other plant-based foods. This seems to align with the creature's reported sightings in lush, forested regions, and in areas buxom with fruits and berries at certain times of the year. On the other end of the spectrum, there are other accounts of Bigfoot hunting and consuming small game, such as deer, rabbit, or fish, indicating the potential omnivorous diet. Some also believe that Bigfoot is a scavenger. There are those reports of Bigfoot feeding on campground dumpsters, roadkill carcasses, or leftovers from other predators. Wildlife biologists argue that sustaining a large primate in the wild requires access to a wide range of food sources. They raise questions about the availability of such resources in regions with reported Bigfoot sightings. Bigfoot sightings, for the most part, are associated with densely wooded and mountainous regions. These suggest that the environments are rich in vegetation and potential prey. The Bigfoot creature may also adapt to different habitats, altering its diet to match local resources. Some researchers have speculated that Bigfoot might actually follow seasonal food availability moving across its territory for sustenance. This adaptability could explain its reported sightings in various climates and ecosystems around North America. To survive in the wild, Bigfoot may need to adjust its diet seasonally. In warmer months, it may rely more on fruits, vegetables, and smaller prey. During harsh winters, when these food sources become scarcer, it may lean towards hunting and scavenging. For example, a 500-pound primate would require a substantial amount of calories to survive in the winter. Estimates suggest that such a creature might need to consume up to 6,000 calories per day 
to support its metabolic needs during this time of scarcity. Just to give you an idea of how much meat one adult creature would have to consume daily in winter months, the amount of venison you get from a 120-pound white-tailed deer, which is about the average, at least here on the East Coast, can vary based on several factors, including age, sex of the deer, and the condition of the deer. And, on average, you can expect to yield anywhere from 40 to 80 pounds of venison meat from a 120-pound deer. The amount of organ meat in an adult deer can vary, but as a general guideline, the combined weight of heart, liver, and lungs from an adult deer can roughly estimate to around 5 to 10 pounds. Now, keep in mind that this estimate is a rough average, but one pound of venison contains roughly 200 calories, and one pound of organ meat contains roughly 140 to 180 calories. So each adult Bigfoot would need to hunt and kill, or at least scavenge, one adult deer, or the equivalent, daily. One interesting aspect of Bigfoot survival strategy, which is not talked about much, is whether or not it stores food, similar to squirrels bearing nuts for the winter, or fat in advance of a lean season. Now, as far as I was able to find, there are not too many documented accounts, fat or overweight Bigfoot, seen in fall and winter seasons. If you know of any, please let us know. This clearly suggests that they do not accumulate fat stores like some hibernating animals. Instead, they might rely on adaptability and the resourcefulness to endure lean winter times. Skeptics continue to raise legitimate questions about the feasibility of sustaining a large, undiscovered primate in the wild, and the scarcity of credible scientific evidence and lack of ecological support for such a creature presents substantial challenges to Bigfoot's existence. Bigfoot's elusive nature is often attributed to its avoidance of human contact. Understanding its diet can shed light on its behavior and provide insight into why it remains hidden from human eyes. Ultimately, the question of Bigfoot's diet is intertwined with a larger question of its existence. The debate continues as enthusiasts, researchers, and skeptics alike ponder the possibility of the creature that thrives in the shadows of our understanding. In the world of the unexplained and the extraordinary, Bigfoot's diet remains one of the many mysteries of this enduring legend. The pursuit of answers continues, drawing people into the captivating world of cryptozoology in the quest to unravel the mystery of the elusive Bigfoot. Tonight's episode is sponsored by Larynx. Scientists have reconstructed the skull of Proleptopithecus catalonicus, an ancient ape species that lived around 7 to 15 million years ago in Europe. Its reconstructed skull and teeth have helped accurately place the species of the hominid family tree, shedding light on the evolutionary connections between ancient apes and humans. The reconstruction process involved CT scans allowing scientists to compare Proleptopithecus' facial structure with other primate species and help them model the evolution of ape facial features. The study revealed that Proleptopithecus shares facial features with both fossilized and living great apes, but also possesses unique characteristics not found in other Middle Miocene apes, suggesting that Proleptopithecus is one of the earliest members of the great ape family. This research provides valuable information on the evolutionary journey of primates and contributes to understanding how various species, including humans, evolved over millions of years. Studying the physiology of extinct animals like Proleptopithecus is essential for understanding evolutionary processes. The availability of a cranium and partial skeleton from the same individual allowed scientists to accurately place the species on the hominid family tree and gain insights into its biological traits and movements. Despite debates about its evolutionary position due to cranial damage, Proleptopithecus's reconstruction offers valuable data bridging gaps in our understanding of ape and human evolution while addressing the challenges posed by incomplete fossil records. In addition to tying some of those loose ends while improving our understanding of primate evolution, studies like this raise new questions and provide fresh perspectives on where something like a Bigfoot could potentially fit in our evolutionary timeline. Not only do the sparse samples we're using to comprise our fossil record leave plenty of room for error, but it sheds light on the possibility that some of our ancestors, like the so-called missing link, and any potential ancestors that stemmed off Bigfoot's potential evolutionary lineage are still waiting to be found or may never even be discovered. Remember, more than 97% of our history is unknown, and science is always making new discoveries that modify or outright rebuke their current answers. 
It just leaves that possibility for Bigfoot's potential existence open, along with its potential fit in our evolutionary family tree. Here we are, folks, halfway through episode 31, which can only mean one thing. It's the part of the show where we give to content creator Michael Merchant, a.k.a. Snow Walker Prime, screen time to speak his mind and get what's ever bothering him off his chest. Now, rumor has it Mike spent the last two weeks getting lost in a haunted corn maze, so we know he's raring to go. So here he is again. This is Two Minutes With. the latest news about Bigfoot? Pretty sure I haven't. We're going to be able to talk to the great beast. You're going to be able to talk to Sasquatch. Yeah, I'm so excited. I bet you are. First, we're going to learn the language of crows and we're going to ask him where Sasquatch is. Exactly. How do you plan on doing this? We're going to use sophisticated algorithm, AI programs, and supercomputers. Uh, this box just interprets signals from the computer and turns them into sound. Shall we play a game? Oh. That's actually a pretty amazing concept. Really? You think so? Oh, if I could talk to the animal. Just imagine it. Chatting to a chimp and chimpanzee. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Imagine talking to a tiger. Chatting with a cheater. What a neat achievement that would be. It'd be amazing. I'm telling you, that's awesome. If we could talk to the animals, learn their languages, maybe take an animal degree. I don't think they're offering that. I'd study elephant and eagle, buffalo and beagle, alligator, guinea pig and flea. I, I don't think anybody's going to be talking to any fleas. I would converse in polar bear and python. I would curse in fluent kangaroo. <laughs> You're making fun of me. If people ask me, can you speak rhinoceros? I'd say a corceris. Can't you? That sounds kind of dangerous to me. I'd confer with our furry friends. Man to animal. I'm not sure if you're on board here or just pulling my leg. Think of the amazing repatwee. Look, man, I'm serious about this. You're just being silly. If I could walk with the animals, talk with the animals, <laughs> grunt, squeak, squawk with the animals, and Lord, they could talk to me. Look, man, we're going to be able to talk to the crows and find out where big it is. If I could talk to the animals, think what fun we'd have inviting crocodiles over for tea. That sounds like a really bad idea to me. Or maybe lunch with two or three lions. You saw what happened to Siegfried, didn't you? What a lovely place the world would be. Look, I really tire of your contempt for my ideas. If I spoke slang to an orangutan, all the advantages what any fool on earth could plainly see. All right, orangutans are close to Bigfoot. Discussing Eastern art and literature with intellectual llamas. That's a big step forward, I think you'd agree. <laughs> <laughs> They're just common pack animals. I don't see the point. I'd learn to speak an antelope and turtle. My Pekingese would be extremely good. Well, I mean, we could already train dogs with those little buttons. If I was asked to sing in hippopotamus, I'd say, why not and I would. Oh, it's really generous of you. I, I didn't know hippopotamuses sang. If you stop and think of it, there's no doubt of it. I could win a place in history. They said you were just out for attention. I could walk with the animals. I'd really like to focus on Bigfoot here and talk with the animals. This is supposed to be Bigfoot themed, you know. Grunt, squeak, and squawk with the animals. I, I really don't think you're taking this seriously. I knew you would scoff. I knew it, non-believer. <laughs> Always the same with you. Always the same with you scoffing at my ideas. You're not even trying to be serious. It's almost as if you don't listen to the words coming out of my mouth. Wild Bigfoot by Larix. The official hat of This Week in Bigfoot. Sponsored by Larix. Now, we've noticed over the first 30 shows that you guys love the Bigfoot videos. You love all that sort of weird, cool content, whether it's fake or real. You like to see it anyway to make up your own mind. So here it is now. This is the Bigfoot Rundown. The Bigfoot Rundown. Well, this is the video that's driving everyone absolutely crazy. 
A woman riding on the Nowagage Railroad, a tourist train that runs in between the towns of Silverton and Durango in southwest Colorado, says she caught this captivating footage after spotting the alleged figure by chance. Many were hopeful this could be the real deal, especially after someone posted this cleaned up enlargement of the figure. However, it's not looking good. There's a nearby company in Silverton called Sasquatch Expedition Campers who have their own Bigfoot mascot that usually dons this costume. Despite the uncanny resemblance we see here, Sasquatch Expedition Campers has repeatedly denied it was them and even released an official statement rebuking these allegations. Although many are still writing this one off as a savvy marketing tactic, this part of Colorado does have a sort of history of Bigfoot reports, with one train conductor on the Gage Railroad even claiming he once found alleged tracks. Staying in Colorado, we hook up with hikers Joy and Claire as they head out on the Colorado Trail bright and early 6.30 a.m., when suddenly they're stopped dead in their hiking boots with what I can only call unsettling. They got something. Are they getting closer, Joy? No? Biker just went that way and the sound got worse. Not sure if the girls are heading back to that part of the trail anytime soon. The Bigfoot community is mourning yet another loss. Joe Snyder, founder of the Western New York Bigfoot Investigation Group, more recently known as Hominin X, passed away last week at age 59. Mr. Snyder was an avid outdoorsman and dedicated Bigfoot researcher for more than 40 years. There has been an outpour of tributes on YouTube and Facebook from friends, colleagues, and fans celebrating Joe's life and honoring his contributions to Bigfoot research. Yes, Some my, emotional my, dedications my, came from well-known personalities like Steve Coles, Nikki Colon, no Brent Dill, and Jeff Harding, just to mention I, I a few. Check the video description for a GoFundMe page link set up for Joe and his wife Molly, which is still taking donations as of recording the segment. So On behalf of the team here at This Week in Bigfoot, we send our condolences to the Snyder the family. While I personally never knew or met him, uh, Mr. Snyder was clearly a beloved member of this community who will greatly Checking in with the Facebook crowd, Richard Stewart Tyler recently posted this on the KBRO group page. He attended this year's Ozark Mountain Bigfoot Conference and Campout. On Saturday night, he felt like he was being watched, so he broke out his FLIR monocular and took this video. Now, Rich was nice enough to include two drone shots showing his location and roughly where he thought whatever he thought he saw was standing. What do you think? All right. This video was posted on the Bigfoot subreddit earlier in October. Posted by Redditor Squatchballs45, he claims it was sent to him by a friend who allegedly took the 13-second clip on his hunting lease in Hanovia, Oklahoma. Honobe is an unincorporated community in southeast Oklahoma, about 25 to 30 miles west of the Arkansas border. This region of Oklahoma is mountainous, heavily wooded, and has a well-documented history of Bigfoot encounters, uncharacteristic of the state's fly drop plains and vast farmland. Squatch Bulls 45 stated he was ultimately skeptical of the footage, but claims he's had multiple experiences of his own in that same area, including rock clacks recordings and an alleged trail camera picture. He even took the still shot from the video and was courteous enough to point out the alleged figure in one of those proverbial red circles. Is it real or fake? Let us know what you think. The KBRO shows up again, this time from John A. Horton on their TikTok channel. Check this one out.
Don't know what that looks like, but I'm telling you, it looks a little freaking weird. Not really much to say here, but um, how often do we get anything with the white Bigfoot? This is another Reddit find posted on October 9th by disintegrated underscore doggo, who says the video is from Michigan. They claim to catch this blurry, grainy four-second footage back in March on a private property about a quarter to a half a mile from their home. Disintegrated underscore doggo was profusely apologetic about the video's duration and lackluster quality, claimed their hands were shaking while filming, and that the video only got blurrier when they tried zooming in for a better picture. According to disintegrated underscore doggo, the figure was moving extremely fast, had abnormally long limbs, didn't seem to have hair on its head, and was massive in stature. The OP faced a barrage of questions and criticisms, with some even accusing him of being a bot. The OP even took the still shot that allegedly shows whatever they were filming in greater detail. Um, what do you think? The Bigfoot Rundown. It's time to bring you up to speed on a couple of recent Bigfoot podcasts and live streams. First in the box, RMSO, Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization. Utah homesteader harassed by Bigfoot. Check it out. These are Bigfoot prints. There's one there. And there's one here. It's in a line. And then there's another one there. Another one there. Another one there. Another one there. Next up, just to prove I wasn't sitting on my ass during the break, here it is, Linda Eastburn in Bigfoot Country with yours truly. Check it out. So that brings us back to this idea, you know, that they're hiding behind trees. I mean, something that large, I think it would be very difficult to conceal itself behind a tree. Well, if you think about this, though, and this is one of those things that if you if you really slow it down and look at it through a human lens, right? Our body, when you look at things in the woods and you walk in the woods, you're, you're there's a lot of horizontal, or I'm sorry, a lot of vertical, right? The trees are all vertical. So by nature, you're used to seeing things on four legs, right? So you're used to seeing something horizontal, like a deer or a, a, a coyote or, or, or a bear, right? Something step out that goes against the grain of all the trees, so if something is standing still, right, and it's upright, chances, and it's dark, and it doesn't move, chances are you're not going to see it, right? You're, you're, your eyes are just not going to pick it up. If you're, because you're just not, we're not looking for things like that. Our mind is not trained to look. If it moves, right, if it moves and it's large, you're going to see it. But if it stands still, you're used to seeing things. You want to see things on this side because you're used to seeing things on four, on four legs because you're used to things in the woods being on four legs. And batting cleanup this week, it's our old pal Jeremiah and Bigfoot Society. Now, I saw this, and it kind of ties things together with the Bigfoot diet segment. It's, I watched those Sasquatch tear those deer apart. Sounds delicious, doesn't it? Let's roll it. I, I look at and I think about, and uh, if if everybody uh, just said, okay, they're real, and they, they said, all right, Where's people come from? That would that would kill civilization. And I say all that to say that uh, they do they do do things like that. You know, I, uh, they hit an animal, uh, they catch it, they rip its legs off and eat it before it's uh, dead. Uh, they, uh, I, I sat down there on Natchez Trace and watched 11 uh, Sasquatch uh, one night uh, kill three deer, and it was like something out of uh, out of uh, nature uh, documentary or something. I thought, wow, there's no way. But, uh, you know, there's stuff like that that uh, I don't know why it's not filmed in America because uh, 
it's happening there. I mean, I wasn't looking for it. I just happened to be down there in a place where it was quiet and there was a, there was a campground that nobody goes to on the trace. And I pulled down there just to uh, see if I could hear anything. Halloween is just around the corner, and believe it or not, Bigfoot conferences continue to draw in record crowds from coast to coast. That being said, there's still only one guy we can all turn to week after week to keep us up to speed on the who's, the what's, and the where's, and that's Chuck Larson with yet another great show in this week's Spotlight. This week's Conference Spotlight is Crypticon, Bigfoot Monsters and Legends, happening at the Clarion Conference Center in North Lexington, Kentucky. Hosted by Matt Pruitt, this two-day event will be the weekend of November 18th and 19th. Speakers for this event will be Douglas Tate, Travis Walton, David Pilates, Ronnie LeBanc, and Myra Mayer from Expedition Bigfoot will be there, as well as the Mountain Monsters crew and Cliff Peractor. Come on out and get a start on your holiday gift shopping for the many craft and Bigfoot vendors that we on site. This is one of the biggest conferences of the year, so I hope to see you there. For more information and to buy tickets, you can go to Crypticon.com. And that's this year's last conference spotlight. Brendan, it's been a pleasure. Take us out. All right, folks, looks like the fall premiere is in the bag as we are all out of time for this week's episode. I would like to thank you for watching and remind you to like and share everything we do here at the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective. Tell your friends. And if you have any questions or comments or maybe a story you'd like to see us do on the show, you can always drop us a line at This Week in Bigfoot Newscast at gmail.com. So until next week, from Mike Lucci, Snowwalker Prime, and Chuck Larson, I'm Brendan Brown reminding you that when it comes to getting your Bigfoot news, be informed, not biased. Take care. See you next week. <laughs>